Let me read to you a passage from the 13th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 31 to 35. It's the Gospel for Monday of the 17th week in ordinary time. St. Matthew writes, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter, I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. That's from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. What does it suggest to us? Well, for the last century or so, or more, there has been a flourishing in the disciplines of archaeology, anthropology, and comparative religion. And the gathered data has become, we might almost say, a tidal wave that any one professional in the field would have little chance of mastering. Now, one thing we notice is how all take for granted the intimate connection between religion and culture in past societies, and that religion is a given in traditional culture. All expect that a society of the past was religious, and that data is to be interpreted with religion constantly in mind. That is not to say that the professional will think that the religious beliefs of the culture he is studying relate to deities that have objective reality. On the contrary, in, in typical secular fashion, he will normally think there is no reality to them. It is just that the society in question believes in those deities or higher powers. But all recognize that mankind has generally been religious. Not so the modern era. We are typically secular. Typically, we consider that the supernatural is just a matter of private opinion and that the supernatural is not a hard fact. The only true facts are those of this world, the facts that can be seen, heard, touched, tasted and smelt. In other words, the facts that in some sense can be positively measured. All there really is, is this world. And anything else is, well, anybody's guess. Well now, the first thing that our Gospel today insists on is that this is not so. There is much more to life and reality than, we might say, the kingdom we can see before us, the kingdom of this very evident world. There is another kingdom present in the world, and, and we cannot see as yet that kingdom. In that sense, the traditional societies and cultures, which are the object of study in anthropology, archaeology, and comparative religion, have it all over us. At least they accept the reality of the supernatural, however poorly it might be imagined by them. In this sense, modern man, who is so ill-disposed towards the supernatural, can learn from pre-scientific man. Throughout the Gospels, Christ speaks of another kingdom that is in our midst, a kingdom that is not of this world, but which is in this world, nevertheless. It is a kingdom that cannot be seen, and it is God's kingdom. God has entrusted this unseen yet ever-present kingdom to his divine Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This kingdom consists of Jesus Christ and those who live in him. This is the truest and most fundamental reality that is constantly before us, a, harder, a far harder fact and a much more
concrete reality than the very vulnerable world of our immediate sense experience. The sicknesses we experience and the upheavals that constantly characterize the world and everyday life all point to the vulnerability and the transience of the visible world. Christ and his grace is God with us and this is the surest reality. This ought to give us optimism amid the ebb and flow, the ebb and tide of evil and suffering constantly lapping at the shores of daily experience. And how is this unseen realm to be imagined? Well, our Lord provides us with many images, and in the Gospel I read earlier, he likens it to the mustard seed, which is, as I quote him, the smallest of seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. So while it is small and while it grows but slowly, it has a mighty future. We ought therefore never be discouraged if we have placed our faith in Christ and continue to live in him. He is our sure refuge and our hope, whatever be our experience of life and the world. Or again, when I quote the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. In all of this, the ultimate future is bright. And this kingdom is the one reason why we can take a bright view of your future, the ultimate future of the world. Christ is God with us. And because of him and the opportunity we have of placing ourselves under his lordship, we can retain our fundamental optimism, whatever be the course ahead of us. Let us pray daily that God's kingdom will come. Let us set out to lay the foundations of our life in this more secure reality, this kingdom that will never end, this source of all that is true and good. This is the kingdom, the rule of God, which is found in the person of Jesus Christ. We were made to know, love and serve not this world, but God and Christ, and by doing this to see and enjoy him forever in heaven.